Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar and panel discussion on sustainability of biodata resources. My name is Melissa Burke. I'm the Training and Communications Officer with Australian Biocommons and today I'm taking care of the technical side of Zoom for you. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. Today we are joining you from the lands of the Turrbal and Yagura people, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and the Kaurna people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Thanks, Melissa. Um, as Melissa said, I'm Jeff Christensen and I'm the Deputy Director of the Australian Biocommons, and we're a national project here in Australia to establish a more fit for purpose infrastructure ecosystem that supports data centric life science research. And we want to make sure that researchers in Australia are also connected into a global research data ecosystem to support um, collaborative research with their colleagues overseas. So a key component of this ecosystem um, are data resources. When I mean when I say data resources, I mean accessible online data repositories, databases, or expertly curated knowledge bases that hold critical biological data and information derived from that data, which is used to underpin research. There's many thousands of these data resources globally, and whilst the resources are widely used and extremely valuable, the reality is that funding for the development, maintenance, and sustainability of these resources is often short-term and piecemeal. And this sometimes leaves the resources that life, sciences, life scientists depend on in a pretty precarious position. Um, the Global Biodata Coalition, or GBC, was formed in response to this challenge, and it provides a forum for research funders and others around the globe to better coordinate and share approaches for the efficient management and growth of biodata resources worldwide. Um, this is a longer webinar than normal. Um, so in this extended webinar, we will discuss the theme of development and sustainability of biodata resources and are excited to hear from our panel of guests. So first we will hear from uh, about the goals and activities of the Global Biodata Coalition from Dr Guy Cochran, who is the Executive Director of GBC. I'd also really like to thank Guy for getting up before 5am um, to be present with us here today. After Guy, we're going to hear from the leaders of three very well established and highly curated Australian data resources about the challenges that they have had um, and faced and addressed in sustaining their own resources. First, we'll hear from Professor Christine Wells from the University of Melbourne, who will introduce us to STEM formatics. Then we'll hear from Dr. Johannes Zug from the University of Queensland, who will discuss the Community for Antimicrobial Drug Discovery or COAD database. And finally, we'll hear from Professor David Lynn from Samri and Flinders University, who will discuss innate DB. I'll now hand over to Guy to start his presentation. Great. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Jeff, for the introduction. Thanks, Jeff and Melissa, the, the Australian BioCommons team, for the invitation. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to, um, to to present and to join the discussion. So, um, where there is life science research, there is necessarily data underlying that research. And so, for any organisation uh, that wants to deliver a successful research program. It necessarily cares about the data resources, so the, the, the databases and the services on those databases um, that support the work of the researchers in the program, accessing, sharing, engaging with, with the data that they need to engage with. And so the Global Biodata Coalition is a coalition of life science research funding organizations that come together, recognizing this importance, this centrality of the, of the biodata resources. Uh, wishing to nurture and to protect those resources, uh, but also um, wishing to address the, the issues that they have around their sustainability. So what I'm going to do is introduce the coalition. I will outline the way that we're approaching um, our work. I will go into a little bit more detail about the, the, the global core biodata resources, as we call them. So this is a, a recent output from the coalition. And I'll finish with some comments on possible contact points or touch points uh, between the Global Biodata Coalition and Australian research and, and, and research infrastructure. And so the biodata resources that are important exist within a, an extensive ecosystem of, as, as Jeff said, probably several thousands of, 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 of different data resources. They're strongly interconnected, data flow from one to the other, 
um, one data resource curates the, the, the data in another data resource. There are many links, linked data across the different data resources. And, and collectively, this, um, these connected data resources serve as an infrastructure, a, a genuine infrastructure to support life science research. Um, and you can do very little in research, whether you're working in academia, you're working in, in, in um, industry, in, in biotech, in pharma, in agri-tech, uh, wherever you are, you can do very little without producing new data, um, consuming existing data from other people, and, and typically you're, you're doing both of those things in any, any particular study. And so the infrastructure is, is critically important. Um, it's highly distributed. So unlike the, the kind of infrastructures that are used in, in astronomy or in, in high energy physics, um, it, it's, it's, it's very distributed around the world and it's led by scientists. There's no central coordination. There's no central command that says we need to have this component here, that component there. Uh, what happens is a scientist typically, or a group of scientists typically realize that in their domain, there is a, a particular need for a data resource doing a particular thing. Um, and then that grows up and it, it formalizes and it becomes an important part of, of the ecosystem that's serving the community. So we know in the life sciences that it's, it's typically cost effective not to try to recreate data sets if it's not necessary, but to reuse data. Um, uh, typically, it's very complex and difficult to regenerate data sets, and often it's just not possible to regenerate data sets. We know that data resources, if we have a healthy ecosystem of data resources, we have this brings great opportunity. Um, as as um, life sciences become increasingly data intensive, there will be much more that we can do with data resources. Um, and so these will be a powerful enabler to accelerate life science research. But as we heard, the, the sustainability of the data resources and hence the whole of the ecosystem, the whole of the infrastructure is under threat. Uh, and it results from this lack of, um, uh, lack of central, central planning. Um, there's a lack of coordination in how people think about sustainability. And so to look in a little more detail at this, um, there are really uh, two parts of the threat. So one is that, that, that there is some inherent lack of sustainability in the data resources, but also we're facing an increasing demand. And so the, the, the kind of funding that data resources typically operate upon is, is haphazard and short term, often part of a research funding program, not a, an infrastructure program. Um, there's little global coordination between the funders at this point who, who support the data resources. Um, and, and importantly, as an infrastructure, there is no management of the, the, the ecosystem of data resources as an infrastructure. And if we look at the funding issues so on the right hand side, so this is taken back in 2018 from um, uh, the Elixir core data resources. So this is a group of generalist core data resources um, from Europe. Um, and Elixir is the European research infrastructure group that cares about life science data. And we're looking at the number of um, the number of funded full-time equivalent staff members uh, over time. And so in hash, so this was back in 2019, uh, 2018. So the hash, the, 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 the hashed um, uh, bars are, uh, the columns are, um, are, are the future. And you can see that, you know, within a three-year window, the, 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 the retention of staff um, sort of fails. So, so the, window, the window funding here is typically something like three years. There is no opportunity to build the right expertise that's needed for the long-term sustainability of a data resource. There's often alongside this on the, on the, say on the hardware side, there's little opportunity to procure the right kind of hardware. Um, and so this bring, this, these very short windows bring serious problems. Um, then at the same time, there is increasing demand. So we know that across the different platforms that the life sciences use, there is you know, dramatically increasing rates of, 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 um, of data generation. We move towards open access, which is, which is fantastic, but of course it places many more demands on data resources in, in the throughput of data that need to be going through the systems. Um, and as new technologies emerge, um, we need new data resources to be added to the ecosystem to deal with the new data types and to serve the new user communities. Uh, and then of course the, the methods of data science themselves are advancing very rapidly um, and, and those themselves place demands on how the data resources organize and present the data. So, this has been known for some time. Back in 2015, some uh, prominent uh, actors, thinkers at the time, uh, put together a, a nature perspective, uh, really to outline some of these issues. And that was um, able to drive a, a bigger discussion that happened over the next few years. So in 2017, um, a, a larger meeting of funders, data resource providers, other interested parties, um, were able to begin to formulate what would become the Global Biodata Coalition. Um, 
And so then really with, with a very active steering group um, and the, the, um, the, move, the first funding coming in from some, some major funders to support what the Global Biodata Coalition was doing, uh, things were able to start. So there's a scientific program that started in uh, 2020, there's a secretariat, um, there's a, a letter of understanding that is signed by the members and, and, and a greater membership at this point as well. And so things, are, things have begun, and, and I'll talk about one of the, the major outputs um, a little bit later on. So who is the, the, the Global Biodata Coalition? So on the left, we have the, the members, um, and these are organizations that are either um, government at the moment, uh, government-linked funders, um, or, or their, their charities, the, the charity foundations that fund research um, from different parts of the world. Uh, many of these are already involved in funding data resources. On the top right, we're looking at observer organizations. So these are not members of GBC, but they are somewhere, uh, often at different points, but they're somewhere along the path to becoming members of, of GBC. Um, the uh, members sign up to GBC by signing a letter of understanding. And that really says two things. First is that they, that they support the, that they provide enough financial support to operate the, the, the activities of the Global Biodata Coalition. That's a comparatively small part. Um, but perhaps bigger is this commitment to working towards greater sustainability for biodata resources. Um, and, and so it's great that we can have uh, so many funders already uh, really committing towards improving this situation. But of course, we look to, uh, to gaining funders. Um, we're very actively seeking uh, new members into the coalition um, and very aware that we, we seek uh, in doing that a greater diversity of the types of, of, of funding organization um, and the, the geography of the funding organizations that, that become members. And then the aims of the, the GBC are to be a forum for funders of biodata resources to better coordinate, to share approaches for efficient management and growth of the infrastructure and to share strategies, and to stabilize ensure, and ensure su sustainable financial support for the global biodata infrastructure with a focus on an identified and prioritized set of global core biodata resources that are crucial for sustaining the broader infrastructure. And I'm gonna come back to these global core biodata resources. So how do we work? Um, well, there are really two pillar communities that um, we bring together to build sustainability, to build ways of making biodata resources more sustainable, ways of supporting the, the, the ecosystem as a whole. And so the left pillar is the, the, the research funding organizations, and the, the right-hand pillar is the, is the community that runs the infrastructure, the biodata resource managers. And really the work is to find the, the mechanisms, the models of international cooperation um, to which the research funding organizations can move and which the biodata resource managers can move their data resources uh, to, to meet uh, and to align on something that, that's, that, that allows for greater sustainability. And when we think about sustainability, of course, finances are at the heart of this. Having sufficient finances, having a stable source of finances is really key. But around that, there are many other layers of sustainability um, and finance alone isn't sufficient. So there is a need, for example, to be able to cap to, to, to recruit the appropriate staff, to bring in the appropriate skills in a sustainable way, to offer appropriate career structures for those staff to, 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 to remain in position and to continue to contribute to the, to the data resource. Every data resource needs a community. If it's consuming data from somewhere, the community that's providing the data needs to be healthy. Um, it may be consuming data from another data resource. Um, and if that's the case, then, then that data resource itself needs to have sustainability. Um, a community of scientists using a data resource will comment on the services, they'll comment on the, um, on, on the data content, and they may well provide uh, curation, uh, annotation into the system as well. So, so direct scientific input into the content. Um, the partner data resources, often the job of work to be done is shared by multiple data resources that work together to, 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 to achieve, the, the, to, to support the services they want to provide. Linking in with the publication process is very important in sustainability. So there is a, 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 an appropriately set up link between data sets and the publications that describe those data sets or where those data sets are reused. Linking into policy regulation at different levels is appropriate having the right kind of host organization to look after the data resource to sustain it, having the appropriate technical infrastructure and having the right kind of governance to make sure that things uh, remain appropriate for the communities to be served and, and, and remain sustainable. And so many different layers to, to sustainability. So to go into a bit more detail about how we work with the research funding organizations, the left-hand pillar community 
Uh, we uh, spend our time exploring how existing funding for data resources works, looking for opportunities in this, and, and trying to find these internationally aligned approaches that I, that I mentioned. Uh, and of course, to encourage membership and to, to provide things back for our members immediately, we, we aim to build a dynamic and rewarding membership program. An example of the kind of work we're doing here. So a lot of our work is about knowledge exchange between the, um, between the member organizations. Uh, we have a, a, a board working group, so a working group made up of members and, and some observers that's looking at sustainability and, and are currently working on working towards a white paper that will come out, we hope, later in the year. Um, that looks at the kind of principles and um, that, that one needs to adopt to, to make data resources sustainable um, and um, is, is suggesting a number of international cooperative models that, um, that, 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 that one might adopt uh, to support data resources. So that's a work in progress, but we hope for a, um, a, a very rich and detailed uh, white paper to come out uh, later in the year. And then onto the right-hand pillar, uh, so that the community of managers of the, the biodata resources themselves. So here we have to build, build this community. Not everyone knows each other, but it's several thousand data resources around the world. We don't know the shape of this, that because there's no central control, there's no central command, um, we don't know where all the parts are. We don't know exactly how they operate. So part of the work here is to characterize that the ecosystem to understand the data resources within it. Um, to work to identify uh, redundancies, gaps, weaknesses, and opportunities and then to align with the, the cooperative, the international cooperative funding um, models that, 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 that are, that are co-developed with the, uh, the funding organizations. And so when we, on the left here, we just see that the breakdown of, of, of the thousands of data resources. In the center, we have, a, um, uh, we have what we call a core. I'll come back to explain that in a moment. Um, one piece of work that's not, it, it, it's, it, well, it's due to, um, it's due to, there'll be some preprints within the next few weeks. Um, this is to build an inventory of, of the global resources. So what exists in this, um, in, in amongst these thousands? Um, we're trying to do this in a way that is, is reproducible so that regularly we can rerun the process. Um, we appreciate there will be gaps, um, but, but working with other registries and catalog projects, we hope to be able to fill at least some of those gaps. Um, but that's an interesting piece of work to, to really understand the layout and the configurations of these different data resources. So the Global Core by Data Resources, um, we, we define as um, those data resources that have a fundamental importance to the wider biological and life sciences community and the long-term preservation of biological data, and at the same time show high levels of usage, scientific quality and service. Uh, and we characterize them as, as certainly being those that provide free and open access. Um, they need to be used extensively um, in terms of the number of users and the, the, the distribution, the global distribution of their users. Um, they're, they're mature, they're comprehensive, they're considered by the community to be the authority in their field, um, provide high scientific quality and, and professional standard of service delivery. Um, and so this set of criteria allows us to define um, a process to select global biodata resources. And back in, well, at the beginning of 2022, we started a process and we resolved the first set of global core biodata resources in, in December. Um, and it's a list of 37. And so the selection, so, so the Global Biodata Coalition developed the, um, the, the criteria for inclusion, um, but an independent panel of experts provided the review process and it was a two-stage um, two application. Um, and, and through that 37 Global Core Biodata resources were selected in the first tranche of these uh, 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 under this classification. And so in there, I don't have time to go into details about all of them. It's all available on the website. It's a mixture of data resources that um, accept depositions um, and data resources that provide curation and, and knowledge on top of deposited data elsewhere, and then some resources that offer both of these, these functions. Um, there is a, a, a good geographical spread of the resources, but there are biases. There are, there are more in the uh, more, more data resources that are hosted and, and su supported by funders in um, North America, in Europe, for example. Um, and, and then they cover a range of different topics uh, from, you know, the, the, the big omics data resources through ecology, literature, drug discovery, biodiversity. Uh, but again, there is a skew here. There's, there's a, a, a greater um, abundance in the set of, of the molecular biology data resources. And so we prioritize these for, for several reasons. Um, in part because the, the, the global core biodata resources are fundamental um, uh, for the, the, the whole infrastructure, they're fundamental for the ecosystem. 
And we tend to think of these as being analogous to keystone species in an ecosystem. So they're, they're those species that are, that are bringing, a, 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 bringing energy into the system, or they're those species that are that, or they're, those species that are, that are nodal, they're providing um, a great connectivity to a large number of other data resources. And so focusing on the core will help to protect not only the core itself, but because there are so many dependencies and so much interconnectivity, it will help to protect the, the, the entirety of the ecosystem. So all of the smaller, um, the smaller uh, data resources. And so we imagine some benefits will come from this process of defining global core biodata resources. For researchers, it will be clearer to, to, to make a confident um, uh, decision about how to comply with funder and publisher requirements for, for depositing data, for um, uh, for making data open and for citing data. Uh, for the funders and for publishers, um, it gives a signposting mechanism uh, that can be used to point their, their, their submitting authors to the appropriate, um, or their, um, their grantees to the appropriate places, the appropriate data resources. For the individual funding agencies, the process and having a list of, of global core biodata resources really serves as a model uh, for incoming proposals to build new data resources or to extend data resources. Um, and then for data resources that are being developed, you have an a set of examples of good practice to inform your own development. Um, for uh, the, the, those data resources that are selected as global core, um, opportunities to build that community, to work together, to share expertise and to drive um, uh, further collaboration. And then for everyone, um, these data resources enable open data, they help research, they, they promote data reuse, they allow data reuse. Um, and, and working towards the, the, um, the status of GCDR itself drives, drives a move towards greater openness in data and services. And so um, we're aware that the 37 doesn't capture everything that exists in the world, um, so uh, that, that, we, that we feel should be captured. And so we're having another round, and this is a pretty much a direct repeat of the round in 2022. So that's um, uh, all documented on, on the website under the link here. Um, uh, but we're running various events to, to help to promote and to assist people in, in applications if they if they if they wish. And um, uh, well, we're very keen to discuss that with with incoming resources uh, as appropriate. So finally, uh, just to mention a few of the the values under which we operate. Um, so we have our very you know targeted, more targeted, direct work towards um, towards sustainability. Um, but one of the key values is that data is the openness in data, uh, and we know that without open data, there is limited sustainability. Community isn't built, um, and uh, an open data, of course, is a real value multiplier. Um, in our work, we recognise the contributions that different individuals make to um, make to data science: provision of data, curation of data, provision of um, analysis on data. Um, uh, and, and, and actually describing data, complying with standards. These are all efforts and they're very important parts of the, the, the value chain in, in, in science. Um, and we recognize that. Um, and, and so thinking about the, these contributions, thinking about systems that, that um, support acknowledgement, uh, systems that allow credit to be assigned, um, these are important aspects that, 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 that we need to think about when, um, when working with data resources. Um, we recognize that science is global, um, so, so science happens everywhere, scientists are everywhere. Um, we believe that there should be a global biodata infrastructure, that it should be accessible to everyone, um, but everyone should be involved and be able to participate in its, in its, in its, um, in its deployment as well, in its operation. Um, and then, of course, the life sciences don't exist in a vacuum. There is a strong data connection to other disciplines, so think of health or think of the environment. Um, and so we're very aware that we need to work with other groups um, who are working on um, data standards, who are working on uh, providing infrastructure and sustainability in, in other domains. Uh, the true value of life science, data resources and the ecosystem uh, will emerge when we have strong connection to these other areas where you have scientists coming in to use life science methods and data, or you have life scientists going outside to use the methods and data of these other disciplines. Um, and so an example of work here, well, different engagement um, events with, with different stakeholders. Uh, we have a, a further board working group that looks at open data strategy. It thinks about global coordination and equity. It thinks about how one does data management planning, um, how one signposts data repositories, um, how to incentivize open data, how to provide training around data management and open data, um, uh, open data operating open data programs. 
Um, and again, that's a working group that's working towards a, a white paper, uh, we hope later in, in, in what, later this year. And so finally, to some uh, thoughts on contact points with between GBC and Australia. Um, so, well, of course, the NHMRC is a, um, is a, is a valued member of the Global Biodata Coalition, um, uh, and we're very grateful for their support already. There are other uh, re life science research funders in Australia. We're very keen that there's no, you know, this is not an exclusive arrangement, and we, we're very keen that, that broader life science research programs are represented uh, from, uh, from the country. Um, Australia, as, I, as, as we're going to hear through the, through the rest of the, the, the webinar, um, Australia has a role in the data infrastructure, in the global data infrastructure already. It's providing data resources. Um, uh, we, um, I think we, there's an opportunity to think about that role and to think about how that role might develop and might be extended. And so, of course, there may exist challenges. And so I know there are certain, for some, some scientists and some infrastructure providers, um, there can be challenges around um, the network distance between Australian data centers, for example, and um, or compute facilities and, 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 and those elsewhere in the world that, that, that are providing data or need to consume data. Um, there are some time difference challenges that, that, that affect how services, you know, the kind of support that can be provided, for example, to uh, scientists in Australia um, uh, working on, on, let's say, the US data resource. Um, and, uh, but there needs to be, for the, for the Australian data resources to work, of course, there needs to be connectivity with the global ecosystem. And it would be good, I think, to, 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 to understand that um, and try to profile that. Um, so there are data flows that necessarily involve flow into and out of Australia. And, and I think these are, the, these are important. And, and I think if, we, um, if we, we had opportunities to discuss, I think we would learn a great deal about the nature of the, um, the global ecosystem. Um, Researchers themselves, of course, are accessing data from the global system. Um, we're aware that, that because perhaps the network distance and the time zone difference, but perhaps other factors, um, that that may not be optimal. Um, and, and there are certainly opportunities with, with Global Biodata Coalition to look at that. Um, but I think as well, there's a possible role of, um, given the extent of investment and expertise in infrastructure and, and um, data resources, in the life sciences in Australia, there is an opportunity to look at how um, Australia can contribute to the global core of biodata resources, um, uh, perhaps by contributing to one of the existing global, global core biodata resources, or perhaps by contributing new resources um, uh, in terms of operating, hosting, uh, brokering data, perhaps. And so I think there are discussions to be had about the, 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 the broader role of, of Australia in that. And so with that, I would like to thank the, the GBC member organizations, the observer organizations, the um, members of the Global Core by Data Resource Forum, which is the set of managers of the data resources in the, in the Global Core, um, and the small but, but very active team at the, the, the GBC Secretariat. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to, to uh, answer any questions or, or provide any clarifications. Thanks, Guy. Um... Everyone can write questions into the Q&A box. Um, so if people want to do that, I think we'll move on. And I think Christine will now, will now hear from Christine. Thank you. So it's a real pleasure to talk to you about one of the uh, um, Australian um, data um, treasures, if you like, from a very biased perspective, and that is the STEMformatics um, Atlas. So STEMformatics was first conceived way back in 2009, as a coalition of stem cell researchers started to come together um, and eventually was funded by um, the ARC Special Research Initiative, Stem Cells Australia. And Stemformatics at the time really asked the question, uh, what, are, what are the characteristics of a stem cell, particularly of a pluripotent stem cell? And we at the time were working with a very cynical audience, people who were quite um, distrustful of omics approaches. And in part, this is because we were working with people who had deep expertise in developmental biology or um, stem cell biology, but not in the bioinformatics space. The bioinformatics black box was very confronting because they didn't have control of how the data had been processed or looked looked at and it was frustrating often for people to have to deal 
with someone who didn't speak the same language as them when they wanted to investigate how their own data was behaving. So STEMformatics was born out of the idea that we wanted to put the, the interrogation of stem cell data back to the stem cell users. And we worked out very quickly that they, they were asking really a couple of very key questions. What is this gene that I'm interested in doing in my data? What is this gene doing in other people's data? And then more broadly, what else is behaving like this gene? Uh, and those questions have become a little bit more sophisticated over the years, but, but still people will go to develop trust in a data set by understanding what the genes they're familiar with are doing. Uh, right at the start of Stem Cells Australia, we had four data sets in the, the database. It took us those four data sets to get the infrastructure right. We quickly um, ingested quite a lot of then microarray data. And we found that very few of the microarrays that we reviewed from the public domain passed our QC protocol. It's because we looked at two things in our curation process. We looked at the experimental design to ensure that the biological question could be clearly understood and there was no confounding batch problem. And then we also looked at the, the quality of the data as well. So we, we, we only brought in data that we thought was of high quality. We quickly got a, um, a strong reputation internationally for being a great um, resource for this curated data. And we started hosting not only the local um, Stem Cells Australia activity, but also cons international consortia. For example, we hosted the Project Grandiose Stem Cell Consortia out of Canada, which was looking at multi-omics approaches to studying reprogramming. And this, um, this really showed the power of having a collaboration platform where researchers could, could log in and look at data views privately before they were being made public and also enabled reviewers of that, that set of Project Grandiose data to be able to come in and have a look at uh, the synthesis of that analysis in at their own leisure and with the genes that they trusted rather than relying just on static, static images. Stem Cells Australia funding finished in uh, 2017, and we are now funded by a much smaller group. We're funded by um, a, an NHMRC Synergy project. And so as a result, our focus has also shifted, and we've moved very much from curation of data into using the data that we've curated um, and finding um, higher order patterns in that data. Uh, so um, this is just again to emphasize, even once we started working with RNA-seq data and that was a substantial shift in 2018, um, we still found 30% of data sets were failing our QC quite a lot because even in the public um, repositories, raw data wasn't provided or there were profound problems with the annotations. The annotations were quite confounded. Um, but also we were failing quite a bit of data because of poor experimental design or bad data quality. And so this, this idea that you can just ingest data from a public rep repository without curation, uh, I think doesn't hold. You need a, an expert curation level to be able to make sense of, of, of that data as a whole. So STEMformatics today is a much lighter um, activity than it was in Stem Cells Australia days. We've gone from quite a large team of developers to really just one developer and one curator. Um, and so uh, the key people I'm showing you here, Susie Butcher, who does a lot of the computational biology in the project, but she's the main person who reviews the data quality and provides um, formal cell ontologies um, so that we can um, uh, collate data together. Uh, Jani Choi, who is the person who's been responsible for our flip from hosting individual data sets to looking at atlas level integrated data. And then some students in the team, um, Zara Eli and Nadi Rajab, who have actually built um, uh, compilation atlases of myeloid biology. And again, this is reflecting the fact that the grant funding we have to support this activity has moved from 
generally stem cells to very specifically now stem cell models of human myeloid biology. This is a snapshot of one of the atlases. You can see that there's a lot of data in there. We're collating um, hundreds of samples from many different laboratories and across many different platforms. And the idea here is you can benchmark your own data now and have a look at patterns of gene expression, which are reproducible regardless of where the cells were isolated from or the laboratory that, that they were derived from. Similarly, Zara has put together a dendritic cell atlas, um, equally very useful. We're starting to see patterns of DC subsets, which can be attributed to the tissue source that they come from. And we can, uh, we've developed tools where people can project their own data onto these atlases and in doing so benchmark how similar they are to the, the primary cells um, that, they, uh, that we've collated in that atlas. So I guess in terms of um, what sustaining this activity over this, you know, um, one and a half decade period has meant is, you know, we started out with really good development funding through Stem Cells Australia. We were working very closely with that community to help them um, build expertise in computational stem cell biology, build trust in the data that they and others were generating. And this had a glo global impact. We, we were saw a sought after group for global collaboration. When that funding stopped, we had to be very agile and flip our um, focus to um, support the next collaborative endeavor that we were part of, which is funded by the NHMRC Synergy Program. There's obviously a funding cliff for that looming as well. And the types of things that we can do in response to that community development is much smaller. So we're much more focused on supporting our project rather than our community because of that funding model. So lessons from the Australian perspective and from Stemformatics, I think the first one is that really understanding the community that you're working with is really critical. Understanding the barriers to using particularly um, new technologies and new data and working with them to address those issues. Um, and we found that curation and building trust in the quality of the data was key for the stem cell community. We have, um, we have found it impossible to get platform support for key staff for CIS administration. We rely very heavily on our institution to provide that. And as our institutional funding gets tighter and tighter, that kind of critical sysadmin role, uh, it really gets more and more stretched. And this is really important for, you know, generally security of our system and security of our system sitting within that institutional infrastructure. Uh, we, we were very deliberate early on in the development of Stemformatics to include people from computer science backgrounds and people who are very skilled full stack developers uh, and who could develop really smart user interfaces so that we were meeting the needs of our community. And it was really fun bringing that group together with biologists and bioinformaticians. And I think that created an ecosystem which was um, much higher quality than just trying to get bioinf bioinformaticians to develop a resource um, that maybe wasn't a, wouldn't have been as stable. We work very closely with a large number of other like-minded people. So, for example, in the early days of STEMformatics, we had links out to an 8DB to help leverage their um, pathway annotation processes. And there's been a lot of tool development needed to bring data together into the atlases that we now host. And that's been a very close collaboration with particularly Kim Ann Macau from the Mixomics team. And I also wanted to point out that by building this community of trust within um, the stem cell community, we also actually grew their competency for using and generating data because there was a lot of training with students and postdocs in that community, um, not just in using stemformatics, but also in, in experimental design for data coming into stemformatics and in how you would download and, and on use the data that we curated as well. And I think that has really been an important part of supporting sector growth and uptake. 
So they're the key messages that I wanted to give from STEMformatics. We've had a lot of fun. We hope we can continue to do it. It will depend on funding. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thanks, Christine. Um, now we're going to hear from Johannes, who will talk to us about COAD DB. Thanks, Johannes. Perfect. Okay, so this will be an example, a, a little bit of a different example, because it's actually a, a biodata resource which is still evolving and in, it's really in, in its infant stages and far from sustainable, unfortunately. So, um, and it's, as Guy said, it's one of those examples which uh, has come out of a kind of a domain specific project related um, initiative. And I'll walk you through a little bit where we are coming from and where we are at the moment. So, so um, the community for open antimicrobial drug discovery. So uh, there was a purpose to initiate uh, um, a, kind of an open screening um, um, initiative with the real purpose to combat the antimicrobial resistance, uh, which is becoming a, an issue and just uh, showing here a little bit what we are expecting in the next uh, few years, uh, how severe it will be. And it's and in, in this example here that whatever we um, produce of antibiotics, um, the bacteria is smarter than us and will um, uh, create resistance against those bacteria. So, um, and the AMR or the antimicrobial resistance has become in the last year even more, uh, let's say, acute, not only from the scientific point of view, but also, for, oops, uh, also from the um, commercial point of view that a lot of uh, big bio uh, companies has ex have exited the, the field. And the main reason is, is economics, that antibiotics are too cheap. They need a high um, uh, standard of uh, safety and selectivity. And for that, a lot of companies and big farmers exited it and small companies which tried to get in like a Cajun, they actually got broke as soon as they put something on the market. So we have a, a field where uh, a lot of uh, commercial funding has disappeared and uh, now the government is aware of that. So like in the UK, they launched a different model to in order to subsidize the antibacterial um, drug discovery. So the aim is really uh, what we are we were trying to do is to kickstart and 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 uh, distribute the, 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 the uh, discovery of novel ant antibacterial. And the way we did it is uh, by initiating a crowdsourcing screening facility. So the, uh, and we were lucky that we got funded by the Wellcome Trusts and by the University of Queensland here. And the whole idea comes out of uh, that people sent us compounds, we screen them against the whole set of antibacterials in a, in a defined workflow. And the key thing is that in the end, uh, everything gets back to the public. So that was the premise from itself. And with that, we were running that for quite a few years. So we started back in 2015, and that's just illustrating that the, the range of screening we did uh, is that we received more than 350,000 samples from around the world, 50 countries, and nearly 350 collaborators. So that the uptake of the screening itself was quite successful. And unfortunately, Wellcome Trust um, then stopped the funding at end, uh, in the mid of uh, 2019 which is around here. And we were able to keep on the screening side of it uh, by incorporating it uh, between our other projects, which we were running in our institute here. So, so we are still running it, even though we have no direct funding on the screening itself. And the turnaround is around a few thousand samples uh, each year. So, so that, initiative had been quite success, 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 successful and we tried to keep it on running as, as long as we can to be honest so part of that was part uh, of the of the welcome trust let's say um uh, guidelines itself was actually to publish everything out there so and that's coming back to where we are uh, with our in regards to bio data resources. So we are really in the infants. So, so we started off 
by uh, actually developing our in-house uh, web uh, database in order to get some of the data out. Uh, even though we could have had the opportunity and we, we, we took them to actually export our data, which was generated into existing databases like Campbell or, uh, in the UK. But we had a few reasons to put it actually uh, in our own database and obviously one is the marketing and branding so you want to get your name out there but but the other thing is the turnaround of actually publishing data uh, reasonably fast and but the other thing is uh, is basically the presentation of the data and aggregation uh, and curation of the data which is in our case quite domain specific to the anti antimicrobial space so so we developed a bit of, uh, let's say, more uh, informative visualization tools in order to give it uh, uh, more uh, usefulness to the user. So, for instance, in this case, it's a, it's a snapshot of, of the selectivity of a certain prof, uh, compound against a set of diverse uh, bacteria, or in this case, also uh, against uh, the mammalian cells. So, so that drove our, uh, let's say, uh, aim to to develop those databases, even though they were, we did that on the back of, let's say, the normal screening funding uh, budget. Now, with COET have been established, and I'm going through quite quickly here. So we were able to, let's say, uh, pick up some other databases which are uh, related in the same space of, of antibacterial. And then and there's one uh, data set which we, kind of inherited from the Pew Trust uh, in, the U uh, in the US, which started an initiative in, in, in the, I can see, um, early on to collect some domain specific data. In this case, it's for gram negative bacteria. So if you're familiar, they are, they are the key pathogen uh, bacterial class where the WHO um, brings the, the, the loudest uh, alarm bells because uh, we are not able to to um, develop uh, efficient uh, antibiotics against this class of bacteria. So the Pew Trust um, initiated a whole um, a three year program as they usually do after that, they give it off of setting up a, um, a data set specific for this class um, and with the aim to actually not only collecting public data sets like from, from um, published uh, resources, but they went out actually and managed to convince some of the uh, pharma um, biotech companies, which most of them exited uh, the field, to actually don donate some of the data in there. So there's Acajun in there, there's Novartis, and a bit of Merck data, all uh, were able to yeah, donate them. So this data set was originally, uh, just to give an example on how uh, yeah, fragmented our, our field is, it has been released as uh, via the collaborative track discovery via a commercial provider. Maybe some of you uh, have used it. It's, um, it's uh, a commercial project, a cloud-based project uh, for chemical registration and biological uh, data registration. And they chose uh, that host to, to host the the specific the, the Spark database. So it's, it's a neat, uh, um, purpose built, but still general uh, uh, inf uh, framework for chemoinformatic and biological data. And, and then just to illustrate more that um, coming back to uh, another, um, let's say, pillar in our data set is once, once again, we had a different project this time funded by the Car by Carbex, which is one of the bigger uh, antibacterial drug uh, development uh, funding agency um, from Belcom Trust and Bada in the US. Um, we had one project where we actually started to collect clinical isolates from uh, especially developing countries. Uh, and the reason being is coming back to AMR and, and where the AMR crisis might go, uh, the developing country is actually a, a location where uh, antimicrobial resistance is rampant, and we here in the in, in the in the developed country we use that kind of a sentinel 
the canary in the in the coal mine thingy. It's it's the worst case canary um, cases which we might actually get in the in a few years time. And so one of those projects was actually to collect specific uh, isolates. In this case, uh, one of uh, uh, isolates which are uh, resistance against a specific class of antibiotics, which are the, the last resource for antibiotics on the market. So if we lose the resistance against them, then there's not much left uh, on antibiotic uh, arsenal. And so we were put in the task to collect that data and not only the isolates, but obviously um, uh, uh, full metadata on it with uh, identification QC, phenotypic profiling, and genotyping uh, with Illumina sequencing. So, so that's where we are, and that's how uh, our current state of, let's say, uh, the biodata resources uh, kind of um, stayed, stays in there. So just to, to give an overview here, what we have on what we are trying to build up and we at this point we have only pieces of it uh, on in the online system is a highly uh, let's say specific focused uh, uh, bio data resource towards the anti uh, antimicrobial drug discovery and development so and it has all the hallmarks of in there so it has chemical structures which we uh, have from the coed and the spark so those are the numbers more or less what we have at the moment. Uh, with each chemical structure, we have the antimicrobial bioactivity data, which we collected ourselves within our screening um, institution, but also via Spark from um, public resources or commercial uh, uh, ex uh, biotech companies. And just recently where we actually added much more information about the clinical isolates, which uh, those uh, antibiotics, which people should develop, uh, actually should uh, be active against. So that's the whole idea behind. And come up with a, a bit of a system for um, uh, integrated uh, linked um, data resource, which we are trying to build up at the moment. And um, emphasis is there that we are still in the, in the infants of building this one up. So we have quite a few little resources to do it. Um, and obviously to use this uh, resource itself to build the AI model on top of it and make them available open sourced as well. So, so COET itself is, the emphasis is really of open source, open data as much as we can. So, and just to illustrate a little bit is, uh, for instance, for, for the screening side, we, we have a little bit of a, a quarantining of data because we, we screened a few which are under MTA, so we are not able to disclose it. And for all the public data, we actually had a, a reasonable um, schedule of um, uh, quarantining them for two or three years before we release the data to the public. So there, so that's our let's say scheme in this sense. And yeah, so that's where we are in there. And coming to the challenges um, and which we are currently facing. So um, as I said, so we are not really an established uh, biodata source yet. We have a few things out there. So what we are doing at the moment is really trying to, to get funding from left and right. So. And at this point, we haven't secured anything. So we are at the moment we are with MRFF and NIH applications, but we'll see if they will be successful or not. Um, in this sense, I would like to, to give a, a few data uh, management challenges which we have in our field. And I mean, I'm pretty sure they are common to, to other uh, domains as well. It's the aim was always to, to, to have a highly curated set of uh, data. And while there are ontologies out there, there are still missing ontologies or dictionary, whatever you call them, uh, for specific, like in our case, for microbial strains. So there's so many na different names for the same thing and without a proper um, uh, classification. And 
the other thing is that in in our space of of, of drug discovery and development, there's there's a lot of missing metadata, and and that's just an example here from a, one of the Campbell databases where you, if you look for E. coli strain, uh, just look at the gray stuff uh, is basically when it comes to the uh, proper definition of of a species of E. coli, which strain it is, uh, one third is undefined, and if it comes to assay conditions, it's nearly half of them have have a non-defined assay condition. So we are dealing with, to be fair, with quite old public data which are missing a lot of uh, high quality metadata in order to uh, link them in. Uh, the other thing is accuracy of data, quality of data, which we are struggling with. And uh, and that's basically coming back to chemical structures and bacterial strains again. So uh, there's no proper tool to 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 for people to actually put in the, the, the correct structure whenever they publish it. So that's a, a bit the source of it. The other thing is which guy already mentioned that there are so many data sets out there. And in, in our space it's in the um, in the track development and track discovery there are quite a few of them can be PubChem, European ones, our one track thing. So and what we are lacking in, in, in a global sense is really that we have no central repository for our chemical and biological data. Unlike uh, sequences, protein structures or crystal structures, the chemical space doesn't have that. So there's no requirement for, for people to actually deposit the data in, a, in one way, uh, in an online forum, in a, in a highly uh, validated forum. And the other thing which we struggle, and and that's coming back to the the Spark data before, because um, Pew was running it for three years and had the same uh, issue to actually set up a system where you can sustain a constant income um, influx of new data, and once again the direct input from the user is limited in our space mainly because, okay, IP or confidentiality, because people don't want to um, release the data before they published it. And when it's going into IP, they come into a patent, which are uh, really hard to extract any data of it. And so the main source of going forward, uh, if we want to really combine all the antibacterial data, which we like to do, it's really, we have to go via the publication like Campbell does. And there's a lot of errors and uh, yeah, effort involved in that. So once again, so it, it's a description of, of coming back to this one, uh, uh, a, a bio data source in the, in the planning and working. We have one website up and running, but at this stage, uh, yeah, that's about it. So with that. Thanks, Johannes. Yeah. Great insight into CoAd. So now we will hear from David, who will talk to us about Innate DB. Over to you, David. Great. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation to speak today. So what I'm going to uh, try to do in the next uh, 10 minutes or so is give you a quick um, overview to our innatedb.com resource. Um, this, uh, sticking with the theme of global resources, didn't start in Australia at all. Um, it started initially when I uh, was in Canada, um, in Vancouver. It was uh, conceived as a joint project between Fiona Brinkman's lab at Simon Fraser University and Bob Hancock's lab at the University of British Columbia. And all the way back in 2006, so uh, beating uh, Christine and her start time for STEM Formatics, um, I was recruited from Ireland um, to lead um, this project um, and at the time in the mid 2000s I was one of very few people in the world that had skills both in bioinformatics and innate immunity and um, later I became uh, one of the PIs of the project and, and then brought an ATB with me when I established my first um, in independent research group in Ireland and then later uh, brought the resource to Australia um, at the height of the project, there were um, somewhere around eight or 10 research staff, uh, professional developers and curators uh, working on the project. So initially, um, very 
uh, well resourced, but that those uh, resources um, have waned dramatically um, over the years. And um, really, we're just in a, a maintenance um, setting at the moment with um, uh, little uh, dedicated funding for the resource. Um, the, uh, an ATB was initially established to support the needs of a large um, Gates Foundation funded Grand Challenges and Global Health Project uh, with additional significant funding from the FNIH, Genome Canada, um, and others. Um, the uh, goal of that project, working with collaborators um, at major institutes around the world, was to investigate how different uh, pathogens of significance to global health um, modulate um, innate immunity. Um, innate immunity was still uh, fairly uh, poorly understood at that stage. And in particular, we were interested whether it's possible to modulate uh, innate immunity using um, various different drugs, including peptide-derived um, drugs for the benefit um, of the host. A key readout of many of these projects uh, was large numbers of gene array um, data sets. Um, at the time, RNA-seq hadn't uh, been invented or was just about being invented around that time. Uh, so we had hundreds um, of uh, gene expression data sets from various different uh, either preclinical models or clinical data sets. And we wanted to understand what were the commonalities in the innate immune response uh, to these um, to these different perturbations and, and what were the key nodes in the networks and, and how do peptide drugs alter these responses. Now, we quickly realized um, that innate immunity, like most other um, cellular systems, are not regulated by straightforward linear pathways, but by multi-layered uh, molecular interaction networks. And, and thus, we would need a, a network biology approach to try and interpret this data. Um, this seems pretty obvious to uh, most people, I think, nowadays, but um, I, similar to what Christine uh, mentioned back in 2009 when we published this trends in immunology um, article, this was a pretty new and, and confronting concept for many in the immunology uh, field. Most people were working on you know, understanding uh, single genes or a small number of genes at that time. So uh, this explosion of information um, you know, really took uh, a while for, for people to get um, used to. This is um, the uh, platform um, now. It's available at uh, the global site is anatb.com. We also have an Australian uh, mirror site at anatb.samary.com. Um, this is the um, this is the homepage um, of an ATB. Um, and you can go along and visit it um, if you're interested. There's been multiple publications that have come directly out of the project. Um, the first one was back in 2008 in Molecular Systems Biology. Um, and then we had a follow-up publication um, in BMC Systems Biology on our efforts to curate the innate immunity interactome. And I'll mention that in a minute. Um, I mentioned our trans and immunology article. And then in 2013, we published a major update of the database and had the cover of, of NAR. Um, these publications have been formally cite cited more than 1,600 times, um, and many countless more um, times um, has just the URL um, been referenced um, in papers. Um, the last time we were tracking usage, we had about uh, 40,000 uh, unique IPs um, accessing and the database um, every year. A key um, goal of an ATB was to curate um, the innate immunity interactome, and we manually curated more than 32,000 um, interactions of relevance to the innate immune system um, or inflammation um, in humans and mice. Uh, this involved uh, the review of more than 5,000 uh, publications, and, and we had a dedicated team um, of curators working uh, full time for a number of years um, to annotate this information. Uh, we annotated protein DNA and RNA interactions, although the majority of interactions are protein-protein interactions. Um, for each of those 32,000 molecular interactions, there's about 20 pieces um, of evidence associated with the interaction, including what the sporting publication was, what the molecules involved are, what the species is, the interaction detection method, the host system, interaction type, and so on and so forth. And, and we had to develop a curation system um, to allow the um, curation of this um, information submission into the database um, in an ontology controlled and, and data standards uh, compliant uh, manner. 
Um, as part of those efforts, an ATB became a member of IMEX, the International Molecular Exchange Consortium, an initiative led by the European Bioinformatics Institute, and uh, we remain members uh, to this day. Uh, the goal of IMEX is to develop common standards, tools, and approaches for molecular interaction data uh, and to avoid redundancy um, in curation efforts. It's been a, a great initiative. Um, the uh, benefits of um, manual curation of this information were very evident in, in this NAR publication. About 80% of the interactions that we annotated at the time were not annotated in any other uh, major molecular interaction database. So there was huge missing information about what molecules um, of relevance in the aid immune system interacted with, uh, with other molecules. We also had an initiative uh, not only to um, annotate um, interactions, but also um, genes. Um, and we annotated about 1,500 genes as having a role um, in the innate immune system. This is one of our pages here showing an example of our level of annotation of a gene compared to, for example, um, NCBI, NCBI's Andre uh, gene annotation at the time. So it was relatively extensive um, annotation um, of what genes had a role in the innate immune system. The platform uh, goes beyond an aid immunity and is a more generally um, integrative biology resource. And that's because we, in addition to our own manually curated interactions, we also um, integrate uh, more than 300,000 molecular interactions, uh, human and mouse interactions from various uh, different databases, in including um, several that unfortunately have since um, closed down. Another 300,000 interactions are predicted by orthology. Um, and we also cross-reference um, to more than 3,000 pathway annotations uh, from uh, major pathway resources, again, including several that are, are unfortunately um, no longer with us. One of the key features of, of an ATB that users have really liked um, is our ability to um, uh, engage in various different types of data analysis, pathway analysis, gene ontology analysis, network analysis. So users can come along with their own gene set um, of interest, um, upload it and undertake a number of different analysis. Now this is pretty um, standard nowadays for many different resources, but at, at the time we developed uh, these capabilities and none of the major interaction or pathway databases um, ha had this um, type um, of online uh, facility to be able to do this. And, and, and this is one of the reasons that the platform became so popular. So what you can do is either upload or paste in a, a gene list along with any associated gene expression data, or really it doesn't really, it's agnostic to what type of quantitative data is associated with those genes. Um, and you can then um, tell the system uh, what the cross identifier um, ID is, click on ontology or array, for example, and uh, choose some statistical methods and then um, get a list of what gene ontology terms, for example, are enriched um, among your um, gene set of interest. As mentioned, uh, we also are a comprehensive source of pathway um, annotation, and <clears throat> you can do the very same thing for uh, pathway analysis, click on pathway ORA instead here, um, and you get a nice um, graphical interface of what pathways are significantly um, enriched uh, among your gene set of interest. And you can click on each of um, these pathways and see exactly what genes um, in that pathway were in your list versus uh, which are annotated in the pathway. The pathway analysis has some limitations. Many genes are, are not annotated in a pathway and they're obviously linear uh, representations. So uh, we believe considering molecular interaction networks may be a more powerful um, approach and uh, you can um, search for individual um, interactions for individual genes, such as this example here, and visualize those interactions, see the detailed um, evidence associated uh, with those interactions and visualize them in a whole range of, of different uh, plugins that we make available, including some uh, that we developed uh, ourselves, such as Cerebral. Um, and probably one of the uh, most commonly used features is this network analysis capability. Again, you upload a set of genes. You can look uh, for interactions between those genes uh, or their encoded products, um, or you can find their first or their um, uh, neighbor um, interactions as well. Again, uh, we've developed visualization tools, including um, Cerebral uh, Web, a JavaScript plugin that enables us to do this visualization pretty fast um, in a web embedded uh, way. And uh, that's been published if you, if you want to look at it and is available to plug into um, any uh, website. 
And we also developed standalone applications, as I mentioned, such as Cerebral that allow you to download and, and, and investigate um, networks of interest. You can also download the interaction data in a variety of standardized formats, such as the XGML format, and you can upload that into a, a desktop version of Cytoscape, for example, and use all the different um, tools and software that are available there. And, and one of the things you can do is overlay quantitative data like gene expression data on the network and, and view how networks change um, under different conditions, such as over a time course of infection, for example. Outside of an ATB, we've also developed a, a range of Cytoscape um, applications for identifying, for example, the most important contextual hubs and networks. And Dynet is another um, Cytoscape application for comparing multiple um, different um, interaction networks. So I'll just um, start to uh, wrap up there. Uh, as I mentioned, we started a, as an extremely well uh, resourced uh, platform um, and it's been increasingly difficult um, over the years um, to um, get additional funding to maintain and, and update the database. And really the project um, has been uh, maintained and, and it's kept alive thanks to the goodwill of um, uh, many people, um, including myself, Fiona and Bob, who've you know, put various sources of core funding or lab funding um, into maintaining the resource. Um, and many uh, people who've worked on the project over the years continue um, to give time uh, to maintain it, and, and we occasionally uh, subcontract um, some of the previous developers to um, help uh, maintain the resources. Um, so I think I'll uh, finish there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, David. Now, over the next 15 minutes or so, we have time to answer questions and have a discussion. So initially, we have a question or maybe a comment from the audience saying, great presentations. I can relate to the challenges presented but how do we solve the problem? All this scientifically important, well-curated data is on the edge of disappearing. This is truly an international problem, and in my opinion, critical, wow. So I don't know if anyone from the audience, or from the panel wants to talk about this now. I think we're gonna to touch on aspects of that question over the next 15 minutes, but I do wonder if anyone um, wishes to just make a comment now, thanks. In some sense, I guess it's everything the GBC is doing. <laughs> Well, I guess maybe yes, yes and no, Jeff. Um, obviously, as Guy has outlined, and the GBC is particularly focused on those major core resources. And you know, th there are, as Guy outlined, you know, thousands of uh, important pieces of infrastructure, like uh, we've presented today, that you know really have no um, uh, no funding source, but you know, serve important um, niches in that global ecosystem that that guy talked about um and in many cases you know one of the things that i think that's been quite evident over the years is, is sometimes the smaller resources can be very nimble and, and you know uh, do, you know get ahead of some of the larger resources in terms of the services and applications that that they can um, offer so um it's absolutely wonderful to see um the initiatives um, at a global level, but you know we, we've got to think how do we solve some of these problems locally as well and in Australia. And I, I must admit, since coming to Australia in 2014, I I found the um, environment for support of of not only resources like this but bioinformatics more generally, you know, really challenging and, and you know harder than I've um, seen in in Canada or or um, in Europe. So just some of my thoughts on that. Can I add to that? Um, a little and you know I think this is symptomatic of a the bigger problem and that is funding to develop and support communities of practice more generally where the the, the databasing resources are just one part of that bigger community requirement and the short-term funding that we have really prevents community-minded or community-focused activities in fact you're penalized for prioritizing um, the community over your own research here. So I would really like us to see a healthy computational infrastructure go hand in glove with healthy development of communities of practice within our research sector. 
Just just to throw in a, a, a comment from the GBC perspective. So indeed, so we're prioritizing the global core biodata resources because we we believe that that will have a knock-on effect. And actually, from the three presentations we've heard, that that you know there is a connectivity with with um, with with some of the resources already in that list. Um, the I guess the I, I guess what so how exactly how we handle the very long tail. Um, is not yet resolved. Uh, first, we have to explore it, um, but it's certainly complex. But actually, I think, David, you showed really nicely when, when for example, you showed the connectivity in 8DB has with all of the other interac interaction-focused resources. You know, together, the, the influence of that part of the ecosystem graph actually is, is pretty significant. Uh, and that's the kind of characterization I think we need to have, really, to, 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 to help us to prioritize. Uh, but, but critically aware that it's the it, it's 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 not just the, the the sort of the highly connected core nodes. It's the things in between as well that we that we we must look at. But of course, there's you know we have to start somewhere. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask a question to you, Guy. About I guess we'll start on the core global data resources, but move away. Um, I guess the GBC core global data resources were identified, you know, fairly recently last year. Um, it may be difficult to talk about impact that that exercise has had on those, but I know that the Alexia core data resources were identified several years earlier. Um, can you just, I guess, explain a little bit more on what you, how you see the impact has been for those resources of being badged as a core global data resource? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so indeed, for the for the global core biodata resources, it's really too early. So we had the inaugural meeting of the of the man of the forum only. A week ago, so, um, but yeah, so for the Elixir core data resources, um, they, so I think I think over over a few years, it was it, one looks back and sees that they did build a community. So there's a regular communication that perhaps wasn't there before between the people who operate the data resources. Um, they've been able to characterize. I think in, a, in an early publication, they explored and characterized the nature of their resources. They looked at how they were funded. They looked at um, some of these opportunities and, and, and gaps and so on. Um, so. It, it, importantly, the process of um, of of, of well, the, the the concept of the Elixir core data resource led some of the European resources that were out of they weren't eligible because they weren't providing fully open services. It led those resources to be able to persuade their funders that that, that they could actually switch. They had some some of them had commercial um, com terms around commercial access. Um, and uh, and actually, the, the the existence of the program enabled those resources to persuade their funders that they needed to move to a, a fully open model where they weren't discriminating in that way. Um, there have been some funding opportunities for the people that run the data resources. These are not big; they're not paying. The, the, the resources are not, you know, sustained through through these programs. But there have been opportunities for the the people that run the resources to contribute to. Um, they call them implementation studies, but they're, they're, so there's studies that explore how one can develop certain things. They, they, they don't just fund the, the core, the, the Elixir core, they fund people who are working around the core. A lot of that's about connectivity and data standards and so on. Um, they, and I guess one of the most important things that there have been some, you know, we're beginning to see mentions of, of the, the, the Elixir core data resource uh, name um, and uh, as, as part of recommendations in, in policy documents. So, for example, from the Horizon program in the EU, which is where lots of the European data resources get their uh, get their support, there is uh, it, there's mention of uh, the use of, of of the Elixir core data resources in in data management planning, for example. There's a report from the OECD, a sort of policy report about international data management. Um, and various other mentions, and, and sort of anecdotally, we, we know that there's you know at least one resource that says, well, actually having that having that label enabled them to get much more leverage with national funders and move to national funding as well. So sort of supporting by by leverage. Yep. Thanks. Um, Christine mentioned community there, and I was also, I guess, interested. You were saying that the Elix, uh, the core data resources have formed a tighter community. Do you do you envisage that the the, the global data resources, not the core, um, will, there will be some kind of mechanism for better communication and interaction between the developers of the many thousands of, of resources. And, you know, this group, I think it's the first time we've met and we have not had an opportunity to do this. So I guess I'm interested in, you know, community building aspects of this as well. 
Yeah, I, I, I really hope so. And I think one first part of that is to find, you know, to, to, to understand what is there. Um, and and any, so any one scientist or any one person who's working in, in, um, in providing data resources can identify a whole set of, of data resources, big and small and generalists and specialists that are local to what they do. But of course, going, you know, going outside, it's, it, no one has a real overview. So the inventory work we're doing is important to, to try to capture that. And, 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 um, and, and, I, and I guess the next step is to um, understand more about the profile of these resources, what kind of situation they're in, what the funding is, how they, you know, how they approach open, openness of data and so on. Um, and and I, I do hope that we will be able to run, you know, events where we bring people together. Um, but I think it's important. I think, I think there's almost certainly redundancy and there are almost certainly opportunities that, that are not, not being, um, uh, not being um, taken because the, there's, there's, you know, people simply don't know about things that are happening elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so, yeah, we hope to be able to help to find those. Okay, thank you. Um, I've just noticed the time. Time really flies when we're having fun. Um, I'm going to quickly move on um, and just ask a question for both uh, well, Christine, Johannes and David. And it's really about, you know, if I'm interested in two or three things that you think would fundamentally change the way your resources are developed, managed, maintained or sustained. And not really pie in the sky things, but I think realistic approaches that we could actually go, go and investigate. So, um, Christine, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, for me, being able to draw on a consistent developer pool would make a big difference because the um, software gets out of date very quickly. The data types that we're working with get out of data very quickly. And although we have um, postdocs and students who can work on new tools, actually implementing them in a professional way so that the, the resource doesn't break, that requires a different skill set. So a developer pool would be great and better sysadmin support would be great. Thanks, Christine. Uh, Johannes, what are your two or three wishes? I have kind of to follow Christine here because it's uh, when I look at my uh, resources split, it's really on the on the on the software development, and I don't, uh, I can't lose the feeling that I'm reinventing the wheel. Somebody else already did it for me, but uh, it's not available. So I know the technology goes always fast. So and the light open source goes fast, and licenses. So what we can do now in open source we couldn't do before, but yeah. So access to software development. Uh, database, uh, sysadmin, the, the IT infrastructure is surprisingly well equipped in Australia. I'd never problems with that. So finding a host, that's easy. And, and the other uh, specialty, which is hard to find are data analysis. So it's even for a PhD student to actually work on analyzing the data, curating the data. It's, it's one of the challenges in surface. Great, thanks, Johannes. Um, David, what are your two or three wishes? Yeah, look, uh, the, the obvious one is funding. Um, and, you know, I, I think what we can do as a collective better is lobby entities like NHMRC, ARC and, and MRFF to recognize the importance of data and data infrastructures and, um, you know, start um, trying to dedicate some of their large um, funding um, to support um, the things that support their research. Um, they really have had a very meager uh, focus to date on um, you know, data and, and data resources, you know, even though they're, you know, a classic example is MRFF spending 500 million on you know, genomics research, but not having a, a specific you know, funding call around, the, around data and data resources to, to support such an initiative. So I think that's one I, I also um, agree with, with Christine's comments, you know, for resources like um, ours that are relatively mature, but in need and maintenance, you know, we, we probably don't need, you know, full-time software developers, um, but we do need, you know, someone who can come in and, and fix things as they get broken, um, you know, do routine uh, maintenance and updates and things like that. So sharing um, someone across multiple resources, um, if, that's a, if that's a possibility, 
we're, we're obviously competing in a world where, where the, the people involved in software development are in extremely high demand, uh, command extremely high salaries. And, and so that, that's a challenge that uh, we all need to deal with as well. Yeah. Um, we're running out of time. I'm going to push this right up to the wire. I'll do the wrap up very quickly. Um, there's a couple of questions here. So it was a question from Guy to Christine. And he, um, Christine, in your talk, you were mentioning you have collaborations with other specialists and that your curation work really influences the quality and richness of data collected by those large international repositories. And, you know, I guess I'm interested, well, Guy is interested in, do you work on data standards? And I think a related question for Guy is, you know, is this two-way exchange of information and actually improving those core global data, core global resources, something on the radar? So Christine first, are you working on data standards with groups? Yeah, so we've talked to um, the, the groups of GEO and NCBI um, and also to the Array Express team at EBI about how we feed back our curation to their to them. And you know, anecdotally, we hear that they are failing the same percentage of data sets that we are for similar reasons. But this question of how you make that public is really fraught because <clears throat> there is already a big disincentive for people to contribute data to these databases. And I think if we became gatekeepers, um, that disincentive becomes greater. And it's certainly true that when we were first setting out within our community, one of the first things people would say to me is, I'm frightened of submitting data to you because you might fail it, like, you know, insecurity. We want to, we actually want to encourage participation. So it would be great to have a way of exchanging quality information without it being a public shaming exercise. And I think that's been the sticking point with the, the, the global community. Thanks. Guy, did you just want to comment on that? on that information exchange into global fire data um, resources? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, you characterized it when, when you introduced the question. So, so indeed, I'm, I'm, so I'm thinking about the opportunities to, um, to uh, stress and, 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 and use the connectivity between, um, you know, so a generalist resource will never know the fine details of what's useful for this or that application. Um, and so having that communication is, 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 is really appropriate. But I but absolutely understand, Christine, the, the, the need to, you know, um, flag the positive and, and 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 do more with the things that are um, that, that are things that are um, appropriately structured and, and well described um, without damning those that have not been able to do that. That's a that's a real challenge. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm. Uh, it we're going to have to wrap up. I'm really uh, sad that we're going to have to stop this discussion. I really annoyed we didn't actually include another half an hour for this discussion. Um, I hope this isn't the last, uh, I'm sure it's not the last time we will be uh, talking about this topic. So um, I look forward to, um, yeah, hosting other events in the near future where we can continue this discussion. Um, so I'm just going to do a wrap up now. So while I'm doing this, I'd really like to thank all of our speakers for participating today. Um, it's been a fantastic discussion. Um, as I said, I hope we can continue this um, through other mechanisms, and I'm sure we will. Um, so this webinar is a series of events that's organised by the Australian Biocommons. Uh, the next webinar will happen on the 18th of April, and we'll hear from Craig Morton from CSIRO, who's going to discuss AlphaFold, which is uh, the game-changing AI-based approach that is accurately determining uh, protein structure from amino acid sequences. Um, and you can find out about more events at that URL there. Um, finally, we just like to acknowledge our funding. So the, the Australian Bios Commons is enabled by NCRIS via Platforms Australia funding. So thanks so much, everyone, for participating today. We hope you enjoyed the presentations. Um, so we hope you will join us again soon. So um, until next time, thanks, everyone, and goodbye for now.